the same day I sent off my messenger, the Russian envoy, Monsieur Botiaguina, sent to ask if I had any messages to deliver abroad. He, like the other foreign envoys, had been for a moment afraid they would be held as prisoners. The king had informed them that he was going to remain and then left so hurriedly that none of them had received word of his departure. The emperor provided passports for all of them. The Duc de Vassance Calancourt made a present to Monsieur Boutiaguina of the treaty found in the papers of Louis XVIII, according to which England, France, and Austria were to form a coalition against Russia and Prussia. Monsieur Boutiaguina told me that he doubted if his master would even consent to recognize Emperor Napoleon because one could not have confidence in his promises. I spoke to him about the emperor's unexpected return, which, as he was well aware, was not the result of any carefully laid plan, and said to him, you have seen for yourself the popular enthusiasm. The wishes of the country are clearly evident. If Emperor Napoleon wishes to make war, he will speedily lose the support of the French nation because everyone wants peace. He is too wise and foreseeing not to accept the verdict of an entire nation. Thus, if war does break out, it will be because of the Emperor of Russia's attitude. And I dislike the thought that he could ever be responsible for such a misfortune. Monsieur Botiaguina was leaving for Vienna, and I gave him a letter for the Emperor of Russia expressing my hopes for peace. The Emperor worked constantly. He spent part of the mornings reviewing the troops that kept arriving from all over France. He generally dined alone at nine o'clock, but after his return, he formed the habit of inviting a few guests. All the generals and their wives dined with him in succession. I would come in about half past nine and go into the dining room, although they were still at table. The emperor was told certain curious particulars about the way in which the king and the princes lived. They were very anxious to revive old customs which had fallen into disuse, among others that of having religious processions go through the streets on Sundays and other feast days. The emperor's comment was that the French would never become accustomed to such old-fashioned traditions. General Albert described one day how the Duc d'Orléans, on leaving for Lille, saw people putting on the tricolor cockade, exclaimed, how happy I should be if I too could wear that emblem. Ah, if he had been king, replied Emperor Napoleon, I might have never come back, for he would not have made so many mistakes. Another time, when he had opened a letter from the Duchesse d'Angoulême to the king, who she believed was still in Paris, in which she made certain suggestions and described what she was doing to keep Bordeaux loyal to the royal cause, the emperor said, she is the only man in the family. He expressed his surprise that a woman who deserved so much sympathy on account of her misfortunes had not more thoroughly won the hearts of the French. He was told that she was vindictive. I noticed that the persons who formerly had been most assiduous in their attention to the king and the princes were the first afterwards to make fun of them, just as those who apparently had been the most devoted to Emperor Napoleon had, when he left for Elba, been those who applied the most insulting epithets to him. This sad insight into human nature taught me to judge it severely, but it also saddened me and made me regret my solitude. Life at court during this period was a curious one. Watching it, one was able to surmise how much confidence rulers should place in the affection and loyalty of their subjects. A large number of the most devout royalists, believing the cause of the king to be irretrievably lost, already sought to be forgiven and to explain their previous attitude by expressing their violent admiration for the emperor. Around him hovered constantly members of both legislative bodies, the chamberlains, the equerries, generals, and judges, including those who had most severely condemned him in the past. They eagerly sought his favors and proclaimed how fortunate France was still to possess him to guide her destinies. He, in his wisdom, seemed entirely ignorant of everything that had been said and done against him. He never uttered a reproach. There are circumstances so far above human foresight, he declared. 
that it is impossible to lay down any hard and fast line of conduct. One of the most important qualities in a monarch should be his ability to be indulgent. I am prepared to forgive all who only betrayed me. Consequently, he received all the women except those who had deserted the empress and all the men except those who had been false to France. The only fault the liberals could find with him was that he banished the traitors and sequestered all their property. He also took two harsh steps against members of the king's household, which, although they were not carried out, nevertheless sowed the seed for future hostility. It might have been more advisable for him to allow the former dukes and peers to remain members of the upper chamber, for they would not have been unwilling to rally to his support. But he had become accustomed to think of them as his enemies and convinced they would always remain so. He surrounded himself almost entirely with liberals and even sought to win over the Republicans. These two classes formed the most numerous and the most energetic political group and the one most capable of executing his plan since their interests coincided with his. Already circumstances made my life again a troubled one. I did not have a moment to myself. Other people claimed every instant of my time. The Duchesse d'Orléans and the Duchesse de Bourbon were the first to whose interests I had to attend. I also took pleasure in thus revenging myself by kindness for the way in which the royalists had behaved toward me. The emperor allowed Madame la Duchesse d'Orléans an income of 400,000 francs beside the, hum, the sum of 1,800,000 francs due her for the timber she had cut in the former state forest, which she had taken over again during the restoration. The Duchesse de Bourbon received an income of 250,000 francs. The day after his arrival, the emperor dispatched one of his aides de camp to assure them that they would be safe. I also sent Baron de Vau. Madame de Vitrolles asked me for a private audience, which I granted. She came with her daughter to implore me to ask the emperor to release her husband. He had been arrested at Toulouse and brought to Paris. In 1814, before the emperor's abdication, he had gone over to the cause of the Comte d'Artois, although still in the service of the emperor. Madame de Vitrolles told me that she had just come from Ghent and felt justified in saying that the crown jewels would be sent back if her husband were released. I replied that out of gratitude to the king, I should be pleased to do anything I could for those who had served him and needed assistance, and I promised to act as she wished. I did indeed speak of the matter to the emperor that same evening. He answered me in an abrupt manner, saying, What does he dare to expect? Not to be taken and shot? Instead of alarming Madame de Vitrolles by repeating this remark, I merely told her that the emperor was not yet favorably disposed towards her husband that she must take no further action, and I would let her know as soon as I believed I could be more successful. She pointed out to me that her husband had been in charge of publishing the Moniteur, the official newspaper, and that not a derogatory word about me had ever been printed in it. I requested the chief of police to show special consideration toward her husband, Madame de Vitrolles, came to see me several times. She overwhelmed me with compliments and exaggerated expressions of her gratitude. These later changed considerably. Two months afterwards, in the same manner, Moniteur, <laughs> that same Moniteur, I was mentioned along with Madame Hamelin, a very clever woman, but not a person I received at my house as having plotted the return of Emperor Napoleon. And when the writer went on to say I was the cause of all the misfortunes that had befallen France, I knew exactly who was responsible for this attack. Madame de Cayla sometimes came to see me in the morning. She confided to me her great regret that the Bourbons had been forced to leave in her hope that they would return. She did not conceal from me the fact that she was in touch with the court at Ghent. Far from taking advantage of her confidence, I was flattered that she had a sufficiently good opinion of my character to believe I would not be indiscreet in spite of my situation at court. Moreover, her hopes were not plots. I took advantage of the fact that she was writing to Ghent to offer my services to Monsieur Sostenes de la Rouchevacot, whose property had just been sequestered, although I was aware how indignant he was with me. Monsieur de Lascour, to whom I had given my letter for the king, was not able to go as far as Ghent. He wished to entrust it to Monsieur de la Rochefoucauld, but the latter's remarks 
made him hesitate. Monsieur de La Rochefoucauld was sure, so he said, that my diamonds had been pawned to pay the troops to desert the king. My mild manner had deceived him, and he had never imagined I could be involved in such intrigues. Doubtless, it was what I had said about public enthusiasm which had convinced him I had been partly responsible for the emperor's return. When I complained about his willingness to believe reports which were in contradiction with my character as he knew it, he replied to Madame Duquila, justifying his attitude. The first part of his reply was in accordance with that belief in the royalist cause which he had always held. He dwelt on his joy in sharing the misfortunes of those illustrious victims of a cause to which he was so utterly devoted. In the second part, he did not venture to try to explain my character or go into detail regarding my conduct, but he claimed not to be able to understand my fondness for my favorite flower, violets, which I always wore and which now served as an emblem for the supporters of the empire. I did not at first see how an intelligent man could establish any connection between such an important event as the emperor's return and a modest flower that I wore every spring. But on second thoughts, I did not understand it on the part of a royalist since these men who had imagined they could make a revolution by adopting a white ribbon as an emblem could imagine others had done the same with a flower. Meanwhile, the enthusiasm of the public had gradually become less marked. Certain laws have been passed not in accordance with the ideas which were popular just then. People demand unrestrained liberty, and it was necessary to take steps to defend the country against enemies, both abroad and at home. Then, too, the refusal of the foreign governments to accept peace terms made people anticipate another war in the near future, and this still further altered those favorable sentiments which the nation had at first entertained. It was necessary to take measures for defense, and on all sides, everyone demanded liberty. Doubtless, the emperor had realized that the first result of that liberty would be harmful to him and would interfere with his plans, but yielding to public opinion, he drew up an additional clause in the statutes of the empire. This clause provided for certain rights for which people had been asking for a long time, but the manner in which they were accorded displeased everyone. People considered that this combination of an old and a new regime was merely a concession that existing circumstances made necessary and was a means by which Napoleon later would reestablish absolute power. At the same time, the venomous and vehement criticism of certain men of letters provoked a movement of violent hostility toward the emperor. The hopes of the royalists revived. Some of them relinquished the idea of obtaining the post at court they had already asked for and withdrew to their country estates, there to await future events. Others made up their minds to go to Ghent and explain to the king as best they might the reasons for their somewhat tardy devotion. Still others remained in Paris to try to influence public opinion and to help the enemies of France and of the emperor by all means in their power. The return to Paris of the two kings, Jerome and Joseph, aroused a certain amount of uneasiness. People feared that they might still claim their former dominions and that France would be obliged to undertake the request of those territories. The whole tendency on the part of the public opinion was toward peace and constitutional freedom under a popular sovereign such as the emperor. These sentiments were practically unanimous. Any plans for war or conquest would have deprived the emperor of the affection of his subjects. The anxiety the sight of his brothers had aroused promptly vanished with the emperor so as to dissipate the least doubt as to his intentions, commanded all his brothers to reserve, resume their titles of prince and imperial highness. The emperor, who had had so much difficulty in persuading his brothers to leave France in order to occupy foreign thrones, and had placed them there only that they might help maintain a vast system of international alliances, now realized that he would be obliged to keep his enemies as neighbors. But he counted on the fact that their subjects, who for 10 years had lived under a system of government similar to ours, would remain the friends of France. When nations have the same needs and aspirations, the personality of the person who governs them becomes less important. 
The first time I met Prince Joseph, he was very distant toward me. He did not come to call until a long time after he had returned to Paris. And he called then only because the emperor had asked him several times if he had been to see me. Jerome came but once to my house. For a long while, there had not been any intimacy whatsoever between us. The arrival of Prince Lucien produced an effect contrary to that of his brothers. The fact he was constantly opposed to the emperor's wishes and the manner in which he had always declined to accept any high rank had caused people to form a high opinion of his character. It was well known that he had always proclaimed his liberal tendencies and this was looked upon as a favorable sign. He came to see me, was most polite talked a great deal about my husband and urged a reconciliation between us. This, I assured him, was quite impossible. One evening, when we were all gathered about the emperor, the question of the allowance of the various members of his family came up. France is not rich, he declared. Economy is necessary. A million a year is all that a French prince should have. As far as you are concerned, he went on looking at me, you will be allowed only 500,000 francs if you insist on refusing to live with your husband. It is simply a foolish idea of yours. You must make up your differences. Louis is getting old. He has become more reasonable. Sire, I replied, no reconciliation is possible any longer. Since I did not rejoin my husband when you had disgraced him, I proved to the world that there was an insurmountable barrier between us. Nonsense, nonsense, replied the emperor. Those were just silly fancies. This conversation discouraged me profoundly. I recalled all that I had been through and foresaw that my misfortunes were about to begin again. I decided to ask for a private interview with the emperor. He granted me one, but hardly had I began to explain the reasons which rendered it impossible for me to reconcile myself with my husband when he dismissed me saying he had work to do and that he would hear what I had to say that evening. I called several days in succession with no success. Next, I wrote him and his reply was that we should have to await my husband's arrival. Several days later, I heard that Queen Julie through her that the king in a letter addressed to the emperor had declined to come to Paris unless his brother consented to our being divorced. The emperor had referred to the suggestion as a mad idea and had not replied. Meanwhile, my uncertainty was most painful. It was true that I still had my two sons with me, but I hardly dared console myself with their company. A divorce was contrary to my religious principles, and for any real peace of mind, I should have had to have the assurance that I could secure a separation and continue to attend to my children's education. Finally, after many entreaties, I obtained from the emperor a letter authorizing me to live away from my husband. The fine weather made the emperor decide to live at the Elysee in order to take the air without interrupting his work, which is proving too much for his health. One day, he sent me an invitation by the Grand Marshal to lunch with him at Malmaison, and he named the persons he should like to have meet him there. I admit that I was reluctant to act as hostess at a house which I had left under sad circumstances and to which I had never returned since, fearing the surroundings would provoke too violent emotions and wishing at least to experience them, experience them without being observed. I left Paris that same evening and went to Malmaison. How deeply moved I was to behold once more that place which my mother had adorned and which had now, after having been neglected for so long, become more or less a wilderness. Everything recalled her presence and affected me deeply. I abandoned myself unrestrainedly to my grief. The night calmed me somewhat and I was ready to receive the emperor without appearing too distressed. He arrived at nine o'clock. It was clear that he too was deeply moved. He walked all over the grounds with me and everywhere he would stop and say, how all this reminds me of her. I cannot believe she's no longer here. After lunch, he stepped into his carriage with me, Monsieur Molay and Monsieur Denon. He wished to talk to the latter on matters connected with the art collections. The other guests followed us in other carriages. Our drive was a long one and the talk touched upon a thousand subjects. The emperor praised the conduct of Monsieur de Saint-Hilaire 
ex-prefect of Toulouse, saying his proclamation was that of a good Frenchman who knows the dangers of a foreign invasion. All the Frenchmen should agree on that subject. I also approve of the way he spoke of the Provence. I was glad to hear this favorable comment, and I mentioned that it applied to one of my close friends whose character and mine I admired. I spoke to the emperor about Madame de Stael's having said she intended to go and see him. He said, I am sure she and I would become friends. At Elba, I read her latest book, and I cannot see why in the world the French police forbade its being sold here. I found nothing in it that could give offense to the government. He spoke also of Monsieur Benjamin Constant. He has a great deal of talent. His book on the freedom of the press pleased me very much. He reasons well. He mentioned Monsieur de Talleyrand. I knew for a long time that he was deceiving me, but I never thought he would go as far as he did. I treated him as I should have treated a gossipy old woman and let him keep on talking without paying any attention to what he said. On our return to the chateau, the newspapers were brought to him. He had me read aloud his letter to Marshal Grouchy, printed by the Moniteur, in which he instructed the Marshal to protect the departure of the Comte d'Artois, who had just been arrested in the south of France. He seemed satisfied by this act of magnanimity of our approval. Monsieur Molay said to me privately, his letter is all very well, but I wish he had not insisted upon the return of the crown jewels. It would have been better not to ask for anything. Before he left, the emperor received the visits of the authorities of Uriay and the parish priest. On this occasion, I again remarked something I had already noticed several times before. When receiving people, the emperor had no graciousness of manner, nor did he make any pretense of affability toward them. He went straight to the point and spoke of the subject which they came to see him about as though he wished to secure information and take some favorable action in regard to the matter. This attitude on the part of a ruler appeared to me to be superior to that which consists in uttering banal phrases which may flatter people's self-esteem but which do not hold out any hope for improving conditions. Just before he stepped into his carriage, the emperor wished to see the room in which my mother had died. Don't come with me, he said. It would prove too great a strain for you. When he left, he seemed deeply stirred. I returned to Paris in his carriage because mine was not ready, and the Grand Marshal Bertrand accompanied us. The Emperor read official documents all the way and did not say a word to us. When we arrived at the Tuileries, we found Monsieur de Flao, who had just come back from his mission of delivering messages to the Emperor of Austria and the Empress Marie Louise. He had not been able to reach Vienna, but had been stopped at the frontier of the kingdom of Württemberg and obliged to return to France. This formal refusal on the part of a foreign power to receive any communication from the emperor proved that we could not hope to reach any understanding with them. The emperor wished the princes who belonged to his family to receive the formal visit of the various government officials. They were supposed to call first on Joseph, then on me, then on Lucien, then finally on Jerome. This order precedence provoked violent family dissensions. Prince Lucien, being older than my husband, considered he should come before me. Jerome insisted that having been made prince before his brother Lucien received this title, he should follow him only if age alone was made the basis for this precedence. After a special family council to discuss the matter, it was agreed that the senatorial decree which placed the emperor's family on the throne, had recognized only two of his brothers, Joseph and Louis, as members of his dynasty, having been approved by the popular vote in 1804 and could not undergo any modification. To be sure, the emperor had afterwards become reconciled with his other brothers, Jerome I and then Lucien. He had conferred on them the title of Prince of France, but this did not alter in any way the provisions of the original law regarding the prerogatives of the various members of his family or the order of succession to the throne. This was the decision that the cabinet council arrived at, and it was the Duc de Bassano who came to inform me of it. I confess it did not interest me particularly. Other far more important things were happening in France. Madame Bertrand, the wife of the Grand Marshal, had just arrived in Paris from Elba. Following her husband's departure and that of the emperor, she felt 
she could not be separated from the Grand Marshal, and without regard for any danger, obeying only her impulse, she and her children had sailed on board of a very small vessel. They had intended to land at Marseille before even having word how the Emperor's expedition had succeeded. When they landed, the city was still under the authority of the King's Prefect, while the Duc d'Angoulême held a portion of southern France. Madame Bertrand received outrageous treatment. Without respect for her sex, she was marched off to prison by guards carrying fixed bayonets. Several high officials dared declare in her presence and that of her children that her husband was a common highway robber who would shortly be executed. What seems still more incredible was that her brother-in-law, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, who was indebted to her for many favors, was at that time in Marseille acting as special royal commissioner and did nothing to help her, although possessing full authority to do so.